Thank you for being here today. Thank you for honoring Mrs. Surrett and the godly testimony that she had and the influence that she had. We want to, through this service, both honor her Lord that she faithfully served and honor her. It's okay to do so. The Bible says, let another man praise thee, and not thine own lips. And she certainly lived a life that was praiseworthy, both to her Lord and to herself. So we trust that that'll be the case today. Our dear Father, we come to this time in which we are saddened. We miss this dear loved one. She, on the other hand, is perfect and enjoying all the things that you've prepared for her. We're so grateful. We pray that this time will both exalt you and also adequately praise a life well lived for you. We sure love you and thank you for giving us the comfort that the world doesn't know. In your name we pray these things. Amen. Brother Steve. Let's sing together. Number 38 in your songbook if you need it. In the burgundy hymnal in front of you underneath the chair. How Great Thou Art, one of Mrs. Surrett's favorite hymns. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4. Would you stand together with us, please, as we sing? from Alyssa Surrett, the Surrett's granddaughter.
Thank you, Alyssa. I'm Brian, and I'm the oldest of the, are we children still? I don't know, I don't think so, but I'm the oldest son anyway, of Chuck and Roseanne. And on behalf of our family, we just wanna say thank you. To this church, uh, thanks for loving them, my parents. Thanks for caring for them in such meaningful ways. Uh, you have been a rock for them, so thank you. Your words of condolence and comfort and your prayers and way more food than we needed that you sent over is very generous. <laughs> yeah, there aren't any leftovers, but it was more than we needed. But seriously, the myriad of ways that you cared for my parents through this journey, I can't even express. So thank you so much. The body of Christ is an immeasurable treasure. It's a gift to us, those of us who know our Lord and Savior. I probably knew Roseanne longer than most of you in this room. <laughs> not all of you. Not all of you. And for me, the first couple years were a little fuzzy. <laughs> but for her, the last couple were a little fuzzy. So we're even. So. But I am grateful for the legacy and the life of Roseanne Surrett. Yes. I'm grateful for the example she laid down for us. Now, we didn't always appreciate everything about mom. Uh, for instance, why did we have to eat grape nuts covered with wheat germ <laughs> while our friends had Frosted flakes and Fruit Loops for breakfast, you know, or worse, Pop Tarts. And while Mom was very gifted, it's not always a gift to be the son or daughter of a perfectionist. <laughs> but we are grateful that the Sunday pastor's wife was the same lady she was on Monday morning or Friday afternoon. She obviously was not perfect. I know some of you thought she was but she did walk in obedience to the word of God. Amen. She allowed the Holy Spirit to transform her into the image of Christ, and that made her even more beautiful. Amen. And so for the last couple of days, we've been arriving from all over the North and South America to be here. And while there is a heaviness that underlies what's taking place, we are rejoicing in the goodness of God right now. The gospel tells us that all things are not as they should be. Cancer, for instance, was not part of God's original design. Tragedy was not part of our original creation. Alzheimer's was not part of the blueprint. But our own choices, our own sinful choices, introduced these hardships and sorrows upon us. We all know Believer or unbeliever, growing up in church or not, we know things are not as they ought to be. <clears throat> For several millennia, God promised a solution to that condition in which we find ourselves. And at the fullness of time, God sent his son into the world Amen. to live a sinless life, to provide the perfect example, but to provide an eternal sacrifice for us. And it's through him that we have hope today that hope that we desperately need. And we, we can laugh over the memories and we've been doing that, but those only get you so far. But the hope in Jesus Christ carries us for, into eternity. And to be honest, we've been saying goodbye to mom for several years now. Saturday morning was just the realization that of what we knew what was, what would come. Things aren't as they should be. But in Christ, we know that we will only miss her for a little while. We know that we'll be with her for a lot longer than we'll be without her. Since Jesus walked victoriously through the valley of the shadow of death, we know that he led her gently through as well. And while that shadow fell over the rest of us, his rod and his staff are our comfort. 
And we know that he would deliver all of us who trust in him to the other side safely. And so this could be a day of excruciating sorrow or pain and expressible. We choose hope. We hope in a resurrected Savior, just like Mom, who as a young girl, trusted in Jesus as well. So thanks for joining us today. We appreciate your presence. It is, I know, a huge encouragement, especially to my parents who were part of this church for so many years. Your presence today is greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to conversing with you a little more later on. difficult to put a preacher behind a pulpit without getting some preach out of him, right? It's okay, though. I'm glad for that. On March 30th, 2024, Roseanne Marie Surrett of Kings Mountain, North Carolina, entered into the presence of her Savior. She was born on April 20th, 1943, to Arthur and Marjorie Van Pelt of Perry, Iowa. After graduating from high school, she enrolled at Pillsbury Baptist Bible College in Owatonna, Minnesota and graduated in 1965. On July 3rd, 1965, she married Charles Lee Surrett of Tulsa, Oklahoma. She faithfully served alongside her husband as a pastor's wife, as well as a college professor, and she herself a speech professor in other areas. She, is, she was preceded in death by her parents, Arthur and Marjorie Van Pelt, her sister, Romanza, she is survived by her husband, Dr. Charles Surrett, her brothers, Steve and John, her children, Brian and Carrie, Doug and Kelly, Dwayne and Susie, Sherry and Jeremy, Lisa and Peter, and a host of grandchildren and great-grandchildren, actually. Um, and what a testimony and a legacy it was to be able to know her and to um, walk this journey with her. Brian, you commended our church for loving them. I can say that they were easy people to love in the process, and we are privileged uh, to be a part of that. So, Brother Steve, would you come now and sing for us? Thou on that old cross 
How do you sum up a life so well lived in such a brief amount of time? It's difficult for sure, but as I begin to reflect on her life, the very obvious place to go was Proverbs chapter number 31. So if you would turn with me to what is a very familiar passage of scripture. And let's read it together, starting in verse 10. Who can find a virtuous woman, for her price is far above rubies? The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant's ships, she bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry, her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it, and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain, 
But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. One author called this a woman of excellent character. Another said it was a woman of noble character. Both of those would be adequate descriptions for Mrs. Surrett. The word virtue itself carries the idea of strength, power, ability, efficient, uh, or to do worthy. It is word used both for a queen's train and a captain of a host. Those who knew her well knew that this was true of her in every way. She could be the queen of her home, but she could be a captain of a host too if she needed to be. (laughs) It certainly describes her. The Bible talks about in verse 10 her price. It was invaluable. One author says the poet thereby means to say that such a wife is more precious possession than all earthly things which are precious and that he who finds such a one has to speak of his rare fortune. Invaluable as a helpmate to her favorite pastor in so many ways. She would remind people that he was her favorite pastor. I got to pastor her for the last 11 years or so, but I'm okay with that because he's my favorite pastor too, right? So (laughs) invaluable to her children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren as an example as a helper, as a friend. Invaluable to her students as a meticulous speech coach. And I emphasize meticulous. Multiple preachers in the ministry today talk about her impact on their communication skill. Invaluable to her church family as a godly example, as a hard worker, as a faithful teacher of good things. Her influence on my wife alone is still impacting the ministry she dearly loved. Invaluable as a sister, as a friend, and so much more. A life well lived. And then the Word of God talks about her partner, her husband. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. The trust and safety is what her actions demonstrate. It inspired confidence And she purposed to do him good all the days of her life. One of the things I admired about Pastor as he continued to deal with the poor health that was happening was he always wanted, no matter what was happening, to respect her. And this speaks to his character, but also to hers. She had fulfilled the good promise all her days. It was a blessing that she was an asset to him, not a liability. The Bible then talks about her provision. Yes, it's alliterated. Her husband was a homiletics teacher, okay? Her provision, this is speaking in verse 13 through 19, verse 22 and verse 27. The Bible talks about she works, she's up early, she stays up late, she provides food and clothing, she's wise with her money. Those are all perfect descriptions of her. No one ever questioned her work ethic. Some probably wish she would slow down some. (laughs) This Hebrew expression used here refers to tucking the tunic into the belt so that it no way impedes intense activity. She was a worker. I remember one time I was helping at the house We were moving some furniture, and in my home, the standard of cleanliness was Mrs. Surrett. That was the standard of cleanliness. So anytime anything was said, it was like, well, would Mrs. Surrett pass this, you know? And the pastor and I were moving a a cabinet or something. I forget exactly what it was now, and there was a cobweb, which was horrifying to her. And I said to her, hey, I know a lady about 10 minutes from now will be greatly encouraged by the fact that we found a cobweb in your house. (laughs) Another time we were laying tile in the basement floor and Pastor and I were fixing things so that the tile would lay carefully on the floor and she was circling things we need to fix and we moved across the floor and she came behind us and circled some more and 
we moved across the floor and she came behind us and circled the floor. And then pastor very lovingly said, we're done circling. <laughs> and I was like, do I need to leave now or are we, are we okay? She was definitely that. She worked hard. Number four, the Bible talks about the poor in verses 20 and 21. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor, to the needy. She provided for others in times of need. She continued to meet her family's need, but continued to meet others' needs. She was a giver. They both were givers. She would prepare food for others when they were sick or they were having a surgery or they had a celebration event or whatever it may be. Food was provided at great sacrifice. She worked hard at making things fair to people that she ministered to. She cared about others. Verse 23 and 25 talk about her purpose. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. Verse 25 says, strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She supported her husband through his ministry the many days that she sacrificed for him to complete another degree or to work long hours, the pay cuts or the living in church rooms until something else could be found. Her interaction as he preached was priceless, and she would lovingly remind people again that that he was her favorite pastor. While the excellent wife produces a clothing from fine linen, she is better known for her character. Though she worked hard and those kinds of things, her character is what stood out. Number six, we talk about her praise. In verse 24, it talks a little bit about she maketh fine linen. People recognize the quality of the goods that she makes. Verse 28 and through the rest of the chapter talks about her children rising up and calling her blessed, her husband, and he praiseth her. In other words, those who knew her well and knew her intimately still thought well of her character. A pastor just the other day said to me, she was the most consistent Christian I know. And Proverbs 27 and verse 2 says, Let another man praise thee and not thine own mouth, a stranger and not thine own lips. The comments that have rolled through on social media and other places as a tribute to her have been amazing to listen to. But one of my daughters, particularly, stated it beautifully, I think. She said, I was six years old when I first met her, my pastor's wife. For nearly 20 years, she was my pastor's wife. I watched her display grace, strength, humility, wisdom, support, femininity, kindness, and probably hundreds of other things that have eternally impacted my life. And then she finishes with, I'm a better Christian because of her. I'm a better wife because of her. I'm a better mother because of her. I'm a better servant in ministry because of her. Indeed, her character spoke volumes. I want us to see number seven, her promise. The word of God says, favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. See, more than her charm or beauty, the excellent wife, the virtuous wife, is characterized by her fear of God. One author says, this pious attitude of obedience toward God is closely related to the wisdom that's throughout the book of Proverbs. In other words, she had a genuine relationship with God. As her son already alluded to it, she, when she was a young lady, young child, repented of her sin and trusted Jesus Christ as her Savior. There are some characteristics of her that no doubt would have carried with her no matter what. I'm sure of that. But the fact is, what made her such a woman of character Such one that's worthy to be praised today was her Savior. The fact that she repented of her sins and trusted him as her Savior. She knew many years ago that she could not in herself work her way to heaven. But that she needed someone to step in and pay the penalty for the sinner that she was. 
because the Bible says that she was. And so she did that. She repented of those sins and trusted in that precious Savior. And because our Lord Jesus Christ not only died on the cross of Calvary to pay for our sins, but that he rose again the third day, which we gloriously celebrated this past Sunday, the Bible says, because I live, ye also shall live. Because of that resurrection, because of the defeat of death, this is only a temporary goodbye. This is not original to, with me, but it is a powerful thought. Have you attended a funeral recently? I thought, how appropriate. We all hate funerals because they confront us with the reality of death and the inevitability of the final separation from life and our bodies on this earth. Friend, no matter how strong you may feel today, no matter how young or whatever age you are, we're appointed once to die and then after this, the judgment. But there is one funeral we can look forward to and we'll, we'll eagerly attend, the funeral of sin and death. That's what we just celebrated this past Sunday on Easter. More than likely, you either sang, recited, or heard something along the lines of, Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, Grave, where is your sting? If you are God's child, waiting for you on the other side of the death of sin is a glorious eternal life. But what about until then? That's where we are currently, isn't it? Until then. Until the promised return of the Messiah King, when all things will be made right again, and we will be transformed into the likeness of him, until war cease, evil breathes its last, disease wanes, suffering screeches to a halt, death finally dies. Until we are gifted with a new heaven and a new earth, with peace and righteousness reigning forever and ever. Until shalom covers the cosmos with all things are made new. Until then, there is a great danger. Until then... God forgetting, man exalting, pleasure worshiping, foolishness will still seduce, deceive, manipulate, kidnap, and destroy. And we all are the target. We are all susceptible. We need protection. We need rescue. None of us has the power to escape this danger on our own. Until then, wisdom may not attract us, may not look beautiful, may not seem best. We may think of ourselves as smarter our way seemingly better, God's warnings unnecessary, his boundaries unloving, his call to obedience, the opposite of freedom. Until then, it is humbling, it is right, it is necessary to admit that foolishness still lurks in the dark corners of our hearts, attracting us to the God-forgetting, man-exalting, pleasure-worshiping foolishness that surrounds us. May we always rejoice that we are marching to the until then, that is to come, the funeral of sin and death. May the eyes of our hearts be open to the danger between the promise and the fulfillment. May we live in the hope and courage that comes from being sure that the promises of the king are accompanied by the victory and the presence of the king. Until then. He has the power to rescue fools from fools and to fill our hearts with an insatiable desire for the wisdom that only ever comes from him until we see her again, until then. May we love and serve the God she so well loved and served until then. The virtues of a noble wife are those that are extolled throughout the book of Proverbs. Hard work, wise investments, good use of time, planning ahead, care for others, respect for one's spouse, ability to share godly values with others, wise counsel, godly fear, worship, trust, service, obedience. These all aptly described her. She will be missed. She was loved. She will go on impacting others in the lives that she impacted. 
But friend, today, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, there's not an until then for you. This is what she surrendered her life to and what she lived for. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she certainly did that. And if you don't know for sure that you're on your way to heaven today, can I tell you, we would love to help you. There are many preachers in this room today who would love to introduce Christ to you. And there would be no greater tribute to her life that you accepted her Savior. And for those of us that are saved, how are we living until then? Someone has said, live your life so the preacher doesn't have to lie about you at your funeral. Nothing that was said today is any bit of exaggeration. It was all true of her. And I'm grateful to have had the privilege of knowing her. I'm going to ask her son now, Doug, to come and close this service in a word of prayer. Doug. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so, so thankful for the opportunity that we have to express the hope that you have given us through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we know that uh, today and for now the last several days, Roseanne has been in your presence and uh, greeting the Lord uh, Jesus and, and spending time with him, but also spending time with other Christians who've gone on before her. And or we, while we miss her, We are so grateful that she's with you and she's not suffering. And Lord, we thank you for her testimony. Thank you for what she meant to me. Thank you that she spent time reading the Bible to me and praying with me when I was a young man and for uh, the opportunity that I had to uh, be led to Christ by her personally. And what, what a blessing that is to, to know that I have the hope that I will see her again someday. Lord, there are so many here who have been touched by her and uh, many who are not here who were touched by her. And Lord, we just pray that you will encourage and comfort each one. And Lord, I just uh, pray that as we go from here that we may remember her fondly for the life that she lived and the testimony that she had for you. And I just pray that we would comfort one another with the, the hope that we have uh, and know that we will see her again. And we just pray that as, you, as we travel about now, those who are leaving here to, to go home and, and those who are heading over to the burial, Lord, just give us safety as we drive. And I just pray that, again, we'll just uh, cherish this time that we have together. Bless our fellowship, and we pray that you'll bless the food that we're going to partake of later uh, as we, again, celebrate her life and commemorate what she's meant to teach of us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.